Hello and welcome to the Fat Tailed Thoughts podcast. I'm your host as always, Stephen Dickens, and I'm joined as always by my dear friend, Jared Clee. Jared, welcome to the show. Hey, Stephen. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. So to our new listeners, this is the Fat Tailed Thoughts. We cover the workings of money, crypto and fin- and fintech. Hopefully in 30 hour, thirty minutes, we deep dive on a no, particular... Th- th- 30 hours is about right, Steve. Yeah, that's a Freudian <laughs> slip there, actually. We never keep to 30 minutes. Um, we've got a bit of a hard stop today, so hopefully that uh, nudges us in the right direction. We're on to episode 12, and we're talking debt collection. As always on the show, we talk about the newsletter that Jared drops out on Fat Tail Thoughts on Substack, and then proceed to go through that on this show. So, Jared, without any further ado, debt collection. Let's get the listeners orientated. What are we going to cover today? And then lead off it into the topic and what we're going to cover. Debt collection, the the, the seedy underside of financial services. So we did sex last week and now we're doing debt collection we go we go there's a sort of downward trajectory for this podcast. well it's like it's it. it's, it's, it's again it's a really good follow Stephen, because when we talked about the the sex industry or, or rather sexual wellness last week it's an industry that that's been cut off unfairly from financial services what we're focused on here with debt collection th- this is necessary even the cfpb who's out to uh, enforcing, writing the regulations and enforcing the regulations in the space openly states debt collections are critical to healthy functioning markets. And reason being, Stephen, just the justification here, if you're lending money, you need to get it back. And if it doesn't get paid back, there needs to be a mechanism to help ensure that it gets paid back. And there's really good academic studies proving that that it actually uh, it decreases lending rates. It opens up the markets. It's it's effective. Now, the challenge here and where we're going to start is the incentives are just terrible. Um, and, and historical behaviors really reflect that. Debt collectors, as kind of they've, they've earned their reputation, have been pretty abusive historically. Now, where we're going to get to is there's a couple of startups who, who are starting to prove out And really at scale, we're talking millions of people now that treating people well, treating people as people rather than abusing them, not not only can it can it be higher revenue and higher profits, you get happier customers, too. Um, Before we go before we go there, though, let's just frame the conversation and you do this well in the newsletter. What's the scale of debt? I mean, let's pick the U.S. because I think there's probably some good numbers there. You know, maybe extrapolating globally is too much of a stretch for us. But, but let's maybe pick on that U.S. You talk about it as a percentage of GDP in the newsletter. Maybe let's just kind of frame the problem before we start to unpack it. Astonishingly large is the place to start. Is Debt- that the, is that the technical phrase? For it? Yes, astonishingly <laughs> large. Astonishingly large. Um, so, so let, let's start with debt and work our way down. Consumer debt in the U.S. right now stands at about fifteen trillion dollars. Uh, so, so household each ha- splits up among about three hundred million households. If you go a layer beneath that, you find that about uh, five million, sorry, five trillion of it um, or so is uh, is non uh, mortgage debt. Um, Within that, and we get a little hairier on the numbers here, about 27% of the country has delinquent debt, meaning debt that's sitting with a collector. Stephen, even if let's let's assume that was twice as many as it's supposed to be, we're we're talking tens of millions of people at at 27%, that's 89 million Americans. I mean, this is called a quarter, even at a lower bound, called 15% of the country. This is an astonishing portion of the country that has debt with collectors who, who are notorious for abusing. So, so when we talk about the ability to affect change, we, we've talked about financial wellness companies. We've talked about uh, brokerage companies who are democratizing investing. We could talk, we, we've talked about the wealth transfer and, and people like Wealthfront that, that are helping build new products, all of which is wonderful. The scale of the ability to make meaningful change in millions of people's lives 
debt collection is about as big as you're going to find anywhere. And this is credit cards, mortgage payments, medical bills, you know, things you've bought on your MasterCard or your Visa card. This is the complete aggregate of all of that, you know, lumped together, I'm assuming. Is that what you're talking about from a scale perspective? Correct. And and as may you kind of think about in the US, what, what's going to make up a lot of that? Put financial debt to the side, mortgages. The, the biggest driver of debt and collection, Stephen, medical. It's unexpected medical bills. Now, what gets interesting here, and in this we're going to find this drives on the dynamics. These actually aren't, in the absolute terms, really big debts. The average debt and collections is around 300, sorry, median debt and collections is around $360. This isn't massive thousands of dollars. I didn't expect it. These are really ordinary kind of everyday month by month uh, payments. But if they hit at the wrong time, if you thought you wanted to pay three payments, but it turned out to be four payments you had to make, et cetera, it can find its way into collections. And that just becomes a, a tumbler of bad experience. So before we get into the innovation that's going to happen in the market or is happening in the market, which I think is going to be the latter part of the podcast today, maybe talk us through what the traditional landscape looks like. I think we've all, for whatever reason, and you know, I'm fortunate that I can pay my debt sometime, but it, you know, something happens, you've missed something, some statement's not got its way to you, and we've all had that collection letter and we've all had that call from a collection agency. Talk us through what the traditional landscape looks like today. So the, the place to start, Stephen, even before we talk about the operations is, does debt collection actually do its job? Why, why even talk about startups? About, so, so most of the debt, north of 90% of it, is actually kept in-house. So your credit card company will, will deal with their own receivables and collections and the like. Only about 10% actually goes out and then a third-party collections agency or a debt buyer is actually engaged. The biggest driver there is that internal collections, receivers, et cetera, they collect for delinquent debt, something due more than 30 days past due. The internal teams recover about 20 cents on the dollar. The third party agencies, yeah, five, six percent, and it's been falling. So let's be very clear here. The debt collection industry as a whole, despite returning $90 billion last year back to businesses, their actual correct collection rate is pretty poor. Now, you, you might think, hopefully, that they're at least providing a good service. They are the number one driver of complaints in the industry, bar none. They're the number one for the FTC. They generated over 600,000 complaints last year. They're the number two at the CFPB, 170,000 complaints, just behind the credit bureaus. And the credit and bureau is only one because of all of the uh, data hacking stuff that happened with them recently that generated its own volume. Typically, debt collection is still number one. So let's, let's, we, we went fast there. So let's maybe unpick some of the flow. So let's pick something. Uh, you know, I'm try, I always try and pick an example to ground this in. So I've got a medical bill with a Blue Cross Blue Shield and it's gone past the 30 days that I'm contractually obligated to pay in. You're saying that the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, debt collection team within that organization is going to try and service that debt first. And I'm imagining that that percentage, I think you said in the high 20s percent collection rate, is because I know the company I owe the money to They've provided me services often for a number of years. I've got an association. I recognize I've got that bill. I recognize that company. I recognize that they want their money. Is that the sort of flow here? That's accurate. And most people want to pay their debts in the general sense. So what we see with the collections kind of is, is uh, the economics change over time, the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, and the subsequent years the rate at which you have really delinquent debt, stuff 180 plus days past due, 
that kind of ticks up a little bit in bad times, but it's pretty consistent good times and bad. What ticks up dramatically from right now about two to three percent of debt is delinquent, and it reached a peak of almost 14 percent, Stephen, in, in 2009. That the vast majority of that is made up of stuff that's 30 days past due, 60, 90, the shorter time frame. The, these are really emblematic of, of people that want to pay their debts, but for whatever reason, whatever's going on in their life right now, simply can't do so. And this becomes an underpinning of, of the startup mentality here of what if we assume people want to, and what if we treat it as a way to help them? But the place to start, Stephen, is with how is it done today, which the underlying assumption is people don't want to pay their debts, so we're going to harass and harangue them. So, 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 so let's stay on my example for a moment. So I've got this Blue Cross Blue Shield medical debt. It's kind of in the $400 range. I've not paid it to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Maybe it's now reached 90 days and their policy is at 90 days. They sell that debt. To a third so party let me interrupt, Stephen. So two different models, it probably won't get sold. So a debt collections agency is going to work on commission. So they're going to, they are at the Blue Cross Blue Shield is their customer. And the collections agency, the first collections agency is going to say, hey, we, we are going to get paid 20 cents on the dollar of what we collect. So if we collect 200 of Stevens 400 owed, we're going to take $40 for ourselves. We're going to send 160 back to you, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now, that's just the first collections agency. They're going to tell Blue Cross, we're going to try and collect this for the next 45 days. I'm making it up. If they fail to collect it from you in 45 days, Blue Cross Blue Shield is going to go to the next collections agency. They're going to try again. Then they're going to go to a third, then to a fourth, often to a fifth collections agency. On average, in the credit card industry, which is the biggest single uh, places, you're looking at seven to eight collections agencies for every credit card issuer. So a Chase, a Bank America, the like. So you can imagine this gets bounced around time and time and time again. So this isn't, Stephen, just a couple of phone calls to you in the first couple months, it's going to be one agency, then another, then another, then another. This is, you're getting bounced all over the place with no ability to choose who you work with, how you work with them, the like. And that was what came across most. As I say, all of us have had one of these types of letters, probably just down to bad administration. You know, you moved something, you know, the card that you had set up has, you, has got lost and you've set a new card up. And, you know, we've all had these things happen. But I think what was revelatory for me from the letter was just as you say, the sheer amount of people in this space and what happens, you know, typically you, I'll see one of those and go, oh, my life, I should pay this. And then it, I'm paid. And I'm not seeing the multiple agencies. It's the first one of, oh, I'm with a debt collection agency. I'll pay that today. I, something's happened. But I think it's the interesting piece that you mentioned of this can go round and bounce round various places. But I think the most, and I'll use this as the pivot to the second part of the conversation, I think the most interesting thing for me was the default mentality for these debt collection agencies is you're a bad actor and you don't want to pay. And it's set up programmatically in their tactics, in their approach, in their whole methodology that you're a bad actor and you don't want to pay. And I think what you highlighted in the letter, for me, most startlingly, was if you flip that and think about it differently, namely, you're a good actor and you do want to pay, let me help you pay, there's the opportunity. Am I reading that right? You're reading that exactly right. And let's just put some hard examples to it. So right now, so th there are a whole series of regulations on the book. Reg F is, is the biggest of them, but that's at the federal level. There's more at the state level and there's often more at the local level. So this becomes a difficult to navigate for anybody. If we just take a, some of those regulations along with kind of traditional bank policies so that you don't abuse people, don't abuse people, right. Um, let's take, 
give an example. I mean, that, that's a, that's a key starting point for that. That if a company's sort of methodology and approach and mindset is, oh, I'm going to stay, try and just stay right. one click to the left or the right, whichever way you look at it, of a set of regulations which is designed to stop abuse of customers. That's not a good place to start a business. It's not a good place to start, and and the the results speak for themselves. So so a debt collector is restricted in what they're allowed to say to somebody they're collecting debt from. Typically, that will happen via uh, mailed letters or via phone calls. Phone calls, I don't pick up if I don't know the number of the person, if they're not in my contacts. The average rate at which people at which a debt collector gets a hold of the right person is 0.5%. They're making an average of seven calls a day to consumers. So you're thinking, Stephen, this is going to be 200 calls over the course of two weeks from one debt collector before they get a hold of you on average. That ignores everything that happens after that. Can you imagine you're trying to work, you're trying to take care of your kids, you're trying to sit down for dinner, and seven times a day your phone's being rung by someone you very much don't want to talk to while you're trying to get on with your life, take care of your family, make money precisely so that you can deal with the issue at hand. And that's just the start of your engagement. So as I say, I'm always looking to delight my customers have them be very happy. My entire business philosophy is if I've got happy customers, they'll spend more money with me. This sounds like the complete opposite. So we, we have to, be, way clear, set this business we have to be careful with the language here. And this is why the incentives are so poorly aligned. The debt collection agency works for the bank, for the Blue Cross Blue Shield, for the telco. They don't work for the person whose debt they're servicing. So they, they, the, the philosophy to date has been abuse that person because they're stuck working with us and we can collect more money. If we collect more money, we'll keep the customer, the telco, the utility happy. Now, what, what Summit, who actually is a legacy debt collector, it's mostly people based, has successfully proven they're a reasonably large one as well. They, they have a mentality and they've been doing it since 1996 of let's treat people well, let's help them. They have it, they don't call more than once per day. They have a team of people who think of themselves as almost financial advisors as opposed to debt collectors. They've been wildly successful. They have a much lower complaint rate, they have a much higher collection rate, they have great customer <laughs> reviews, which is just awesome. The challenge is, Stephen, that business doesn't scale. It is really difficult to get a lot of people making a lot of phone calls if all you're doing is using people. What startups have done is take that approach. Let's try and help people. Let's try and give them a payment plan that work. We'll hit on some of the others. What if we could do that, treat them well? Again, we can help them on a path to where they're able to pay off their debt on a timely manner where, where they are now happy with the service and they're getting their life on track. But in order to do that, you need to start with tech. This isn't a start with people and just overlay tech. You need to assume if I'm going to service a million people, a million people with debt and collections, and my entire employee base is going to be 100 people, 200 people, how do I do that? And this was the thing that came across for me when I read the letter. The traditional debt collection agency is telephone-based, and trying to get a synchronous conversation to happen. This is me trying to call you, you picking up, us engaging in a conversation. And as you mentioned, some of the hit rates for the calls lead to that scalability problem that you mentioned. If you factor in how many times people pick up their phone, those are pretty pretty well-known numbers in the industry from everything from cold calling for selling um auto warranties, selling windows, selling credit card, you know, whatever it is, we, we know those click rates and those pickup rates. The dialing for dollars is a, is a sales phrase 
if we know that and we're trying to establish a synchronous conversation, that's where the scalability problem. We're designing for something where we know we've got a low chance of success. I think what you're saying is completely look at this from a fresh lens. Don't design for that. Look for an asynchronous con contact method so you can scale. It was um, uh, Did that, I read that, that right? That's absolutely key to what we're talking about, as opposed to having two people have to meet at the same time. If I send an email, if I send a text message, that person can pick it up at their leisure. That's the starting point of the, uh, of a conversation. So let, I, I want to go right in, into the startups here because I, I get really excited about what they're building. But let, let's start with True Accord. True Accord is the OG in the space. They started in 2013. They've raised $47 million. They really defined the idea of digital collections agency. I mean, they, they quite literally defined an industry. And we've, continued, we, we've since had growth and offshoots and, and variations on the model. But they started it. They're still in it. They're still, if not the biggest, certainly among them and wildly successful. So True Accord started with that model that I said, how do I service millions of people at once with a very small employee team? And the answer is you have to be digital from day one. This isn't a, let me get a group of people and all. This is, okay, I'm going to send text messages and emails. Well, that means if I'm doing a phone call and I need to train up an employee team, I might only have four or five templates of conversations, basically skits to have. Well, if I'm doing emails, I can have a bank of thousands of possible phrases of ways to express something and to mix and match in a way that works for that for the person I'm contacting. I can figure out what time of the day to contact them. Once they get back to me, that's a data point that gets fed back in. I can now customize that consumer's journey so that they're able to, to effectively self-service that debt on, a, on their own path. Hey, this payment plan would work for me on this schedule and the like. Stephen, that has huge benefits for the consumer. They're being engaged the way they want. They can self-service. They can do it on their own time frame. It actually has huge benefits for the company as well. Never mind the revenue, the margins, the customer service. Just on the compliance side, when you do everything digitally, you have really tight control over what gets presented to people, where it gets presented, what's said to them, the context. And in the event that the person... Uh, challenges it, you have a full electronic audit trail of what just happened, click by click, look by look. That's hugely powerful. All of that is data that gets fed back into an AI engine, TrueCord calls it heartbeat, and it makes the product better. And this is the classic sort of, I want to go collect debt from Jared. I'm A-B testing messages that I send to him, you know, Message A doesn't get response. Message B does get response. So I've got two data points from just that one interaction. Jared responded to message B, not message A. Okay, B's got a better rate of response. And the other thing is Jared responded at, what is it, 2.16 on the afternoon. Ah, is 2.16 the best time to catch Jared? Or is it? four o'clock in the afternoon or is it 10 o'clock at night you build up enough of a data set of those types of interactions you know which messages get a better click at every stage through the conversation and you build a data set of when and how to send those messages and you do that at scale and you put that through the available ai engines you've got a, a an intelligent system for building and scaling this business i would assume Correct. And the, the, the results speak for themselves. You, you talk scale. They, they've worked with 24 million consumers, Stephen. I mean, it's a huge, 24 million is a huge number. Throughout all that, they, they, they are uh, Better Business Bureau accredited. They have an A rating. Go on there, look at their reviews. Their reviews 
any consumer company would be thrilled to have its and people this is saying not, thank this you. This is not a delightful thing you enjoy doing. So, I mean, I was blown away by some of those review levels and those net promoter scores. This is they, not They have a by... net promoter score of 40. The banking industry has 30 on average. The debt collectors have a higher net promoter score. People are more likely to recommend the debt collector to a friend or to a peer than they are the bank they use. That's just wild. Yeah, I can't imagine a scenario where I'm going to be happy to recommend a debt collector. But, but, but that's the thing. True Accord has built their business around the idea of we are helping people. We are helping people build their financial fitness. We are providing a financial wellness service. It just happens that the person is having trouble servicing their debts. How do I get them back on the path where they want to be? And how do I give them the tools they need to get there? That's what it is. It, yes, it falls under debt collections, but it's no different than how do I build wealth? Well, this is this is starting a business from the fundamental different place to the traditional. This is people are good people, and how can I help them? As opposed to where the debt collection agencies used to be, people are bad people, and how do I screw and extort money out of them? And, and Those are I, two very different mindsets. Completely different mindset. I, I, I want to take that True Accord story a, a, a bit further because they, they really have done – they've done stuff that, that I would have hoped to see in the industry that hadn't been done that they are continuing to trailblaze on. From day one, they have been actively engaged with the regulators – a lot. We just got a, a new updated release of Reg F that, that gives guidelines on how often you can contact, gives guidelines on text messaging, gives guidelines on use of social media. A lot of that, while I, there's no public evidence for this, I guarantee was influenced by True Accord. True Accord, one of the co-founders, uh, Ohad uh, Samat, who just moved up, he's now CEO of the holding company, used to be CEO of True Accord proper. Uh, he was the uh, the CFPB stood up a co uh, consumer advisory panel in 2017. He was the only representative of the debt collections agency to be invited to serve on the panel. California this past year just stood up their own consumer uh, financial advisory panel broader. He is the only representative of the debt collections agency to sit on that. He, he, the company, the people in the company, not only are they building a good product, they're actively working with the regulators behind the scenes to say, how do we lift the standard for the entire industry? I mean, that is hugely powerful stuff. So if that's the case, and I don't know True Accord, but I, I'm starting to become a fan of their work just from this podcast. Why is, if somebody drops onto an idea that works, their collection rates are higher, their business model is more scalable, and they're driving a better um, outcome for all of the constituents in you know both the end customers and ultimately, I'd imagine, a better reaction from the people they're collecting debt for. Are we seeing more companies in that space? Are we seeing because that to me, as a fan, you know, an entrepreneurial type mindset person, thinks, hmm, that's a business that's working. Let's go copy that business and. And then to so that we, same market. We are. So where we started, and let's kind of talk about the, the where the industry's gone, that, that they've they've trailblazed. First place we saw real movement is abroad. And, and that's kind of a classic strategy in fintech. As I said, the regulatory environment is complex. You have to it took True Accord, even with a strong team and, and strong backers, strong funding, over two years to get licensed in all 50 states. I mean, it's a lot of work. And it's a tremendous amount of work as well, because the regulators had never engaged with a debt collector who did things digitally. So you're as much educating the people you're working with as you are applying for the license. And that takes time. Now, so indebted start a few years later out in Australia. So they basically took the True Accord digital collections agency model, but went in their own nice cordoned off playground, have done a wonderful job in Australia, have since expanded to New Zealand, uh, Canada, and then in the past couple months are now in the US. And again, a hit back on kind of the, the, the hurdle that regulations bring here, they moved into the US via acquisition. So they bought somebody that already had the licensing. I wanna be clear here, Stephen. 
I'm not knocking the regulations. In general, they've done a pretty good job in preventing consumer abuse. Now, there are always exceptions and there's lots and lots of room for improvement. But the most egregious things really are kind of written out of the industry. That said, the same kind of complexity and nuance of that does create a huge barrier to entry for other people that want to join. So Indebted started abroad where they had time to grow rather than compete in a market sure core was, was already building in. Other startups more recently have taken a different approach entirely. Rather than deal with the regulatory burdens themselves, as well as having to have people in-house, the collection agents, they've just built the tech. So that's quite an interesting model. And it's actually often a better fit for Silicon Valley. It, it's higher margin business. It can be more difficult to go to market because you don't have your own team. You have to sell into uh, the, the credit cards, the, the, uh, the, the medical companies, the like. But it's a mod you get that same data feedback in, that same continual improvement, and you're making their collections teams better. So, as always, we can carry on talking for hours, um, and that's the joy for me of these uh, podcasts. But as... As the arbiter and the the sort of voice of the listener, I try and keep us to our moral let, contract. Let, let, let me let me pull one one close as as we wrap up here because it's 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 a really cool story. So so uh, Prodigal started in 2019. They're just software. They're helping improve efficiency, manage the teams, the compliance, the data back end, continual improvement. One of their biggest clients, they grew 8x last year. They just raised a Series A, so hat off to them. They've been doing really good work. One of their biggest clients is True Accord. So you're watching this industry come back around and, again, look to continual improvement. Things, Stephen, on the horizon I'm particularly excited about, they're continuing to grow. True Accord, uh, in the last couple of months, just launched their own tech-only platform to help businesses but they launched something called Engage, which is relatively new. It's, it's just being built. It's, I, I wanna give the concept rather than the product. They're focused on how do I give the consumer the ability to choose the debt collector they work with. They're creating a marketplace for debt collection agencies to compete so the consumer gets to choose. That completely changes the incentive structure. That's going to, if successful, that's going to allow the consumer to say, you've helped me. You've got me back on track, Mr. Bank, Mr. Whatever business. I would like to work with that agency because they are helping me pay you. That is so powerful. And that flips the whole dynamics of who is the customer. And that flips the whole incentive structure. You know, if this debt collection agency's helped me three times in the past and I've got a new debt, I'd like them to help me with that debt. That changes who the debt gets sold to. That changes the structures. Very interesting dynamic. And it sounds like it's too early with True Record to see whether that's caught on yet. But interesting thought process around flipping the incentive structure and flipping the whole dynamic. Agreed. So... Take us home in 30 seconds. Where do you see this part of the industry going? This is a, as we start at the headline with the numbers, Stephen, there is $15 trillion of consumer debt outstanding. There are some re huge fraction of that currently at three, as high as 14 in, in 2009 is delinquent. The ability to go help people here is tremendous. The bar is set so low for what is good service. I am wildly optimistic that True Accord, that Receive, that Prodigal, that the companies, the startups building here will continue to do so. One, creating a better recovery rate for the businesses. Again, when, when you're setting it in single digits, the, the ability to collect more of the debt is should be easy done right. But two, and critically, start treating it like a way to help people rather than abuse them. And that groundwork has already been laid. We've seen if you can do it, if you can do it at scale, not only do you collect more, people are happier. They want to work with you. 
And that is a wonderful, wonderful place to be. You get up every day, you're able to help people get back on track, rebuild their lives and get on with whatever they want to do. That is just awesome. And I'm hugely optimistic. And that's a fantastic place for us to finish. You've been listening to the Fat Tailed Thoughts podcast brought to you by myself, Stephen Dickens. I run the um, good news section of our service here. So if you've got any good news, you want got some good feedback, you want to promote us, you want to click and subscribe, and you want to tell your friends and you want to share that, at Stephen Dickens 3. The um, negative comments part of our team here is run by Cleebeard on Twitter. All joking aside, we'd love you to engage with the podcast. We're on episode 12 this week and we're trying to grow this show please click and subscribe. And if you really like the show, give us a review. Those really help with the rankings and bringing this to more audience. We'll be back next week where we bring you more from the Fat Tailed Thoughts team on the makings and workings of money, fintech, and crypto. Thanks very much for listening.